Good evening, Rock Church. On Wednesday night, time for another session with God. Hallelujah. Hope we find everybody doing well, staying in out of the heat. As you can tell, Pastor Ed isn't here tonight. So I'm going to bring you the message. And for those of you who may not know me, I am Pastor Gary. <clears throat> tonight, I want to talk to us simply about the title of my message. Do we have a role in determining what kind of life we have while we're here on earth? Do we actually have a role? I know the Word of God tells us that God has a plan and a purpose for us. So is He just going to cause those plans and purposes to supernaturally, automatically manifest in our lives or do you and I actually have a role a part to play in what we experience while we're here on earth and just remember while we're here on earth this is a foreign country for us because this is not where we're intended to be we're intended to be in heaven and we will be caught up with every living every saint who has died with Jesus and be taken to heaven, hallelujah, to our home where he has prepared a mansion, where he has set up things we can't even imagine for us. Glory to God. Can't wait. The sooner the better. Come back quickly, Lord Jesus. I want to read, to start with, something that we need to understand, and Pastor has talked about this in the last few weeks in different sections of his Wednesday and Sunday morning services. And that is simply, we have to have a foundation that we are rooted into. <clears throat> and I want to read this out of the New Living, Romans 8, and I'm going to start in verse 31. Simply says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything else? Notice these are questions. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For Christ Jesus himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for you and me. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us, who went to the cross and provided a finished work for you and me. That last part I added on my own. And I am convinced that nothing can even separate us, ever separate us from God's love. Neither death or life, nor angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. That is a foundation that you and I need to simply make sure that we know that we know that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. When you have that deeply rooted in your heart, no matter what attack comes, as it said, whether you're hungry, destitute, in poverty, you have troubles, angels, demons, nothing can separate you from the love of God. God even says that you and I are the apple of his eye. Hallelujah. If you have been around me at all 
you know that I've always said that everything in life boils down to one thing, choices. What choices are we making, good or bad, will determine whether good or bad things come into our lives. Well, what kind of life do we have here on earth is determined by choices that we've made. Not only the ones that we have made, but the ones we're going to make, the ones we need to make. How many know that you can be angry and have unforgiveness in your life? And until you make a choice to forgive that person, you're going to continue walking in unforgiveness. And we know the scripture says that if you don't forgive them, God can't forgive you. So why would we make a choice, choose to not walk in forgiveness so that we know that we are the forgiven of God? It's amazing what the flesh and the carnal mind can convince us is okay, that God will kind of wink at and not go by what his word says. That's the other one of the other things that's a concrete thing. God's word is truth. End of story. He's not going to change it for one iota, for one reason. He is bound by his word. He is not a man who should lie. Hallelujah. Thank God that when he says something, you can take it to the bank. It's truth. It's going to happen. Hallelujah. You know, there's an old saying that goes something like this. Um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting things to change. Well, I like to put it this way. The definition of insanity is continuing to make the same choices you've made in the past and not seeing a change that you want because change won't come until you make a different choice. Glory to God. We can do that. How do I know? Because all things are possible to them who believe. Do you believe God can change you? Do you believe God can change your heart, the way you think, the way you act, the way you speak? If you say no, or if you're wondering, well, I don't know if he can, then you better get in the Word of God and recognize, find the Scriptures, because there are all those things are Scriptures out of the Word of God. And if God has said it, will He not see to it that His Word is performed? He watches over His Word, in fact, to see to it that His Word is performed in your life. All we have to do is supply the part that says, I believe. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> there are 613 commandments between Genesis and Deuteronomy. 613 commandments. Yeah, but pastor, that's Old Testament. We, we're in a New Testament relationship with God. Well, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he had commandments in the Old Testament to the Israelites, they do carry over and pertain to us also. Let me just read one of them out of Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There are two Hebrew words for the English word one. The first means a single or only one. The second is a compound unity. It is the second that is used in this verse so the verse implies the Trinity. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Wow, we find that same statement in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37. New Testament. God's the same yesterday and today. He doesn't change his mind about his word. Again, you can take it to the bank. Glory to God. In the New Testament, there are roughly 1,050 laws. Do you realize that none of us 
In fact, no one with the exception of Jesus was able to walk on this earth and keep all the commandments and all the laws. And nobody else has yet managed to do that and never will, I might add. I want to go to Matthew 5, 17. So if we can turn there real quick. Or maybe not so quick. Big Bible, you know. A lot of pages to go through. Hallelujah. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law or all the prophecies of the prophets. He simply said, no, I came to fulfill them. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass from the law till it be fulfilled. Well, when Jesus went to the cross, he fulfilled all the laws. He won the victory. It was a finished work. Glory to God. Right now, I just want to stop and say, praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for your willingness to go to the cross. Thank you, Father, that you were willing to give your only begotten Son to become a substitute, to bear our sins and all of our wickedness upon him not only that but he bore the stripes that we might partake of divine healing from you lord and we just want to give you all the glory and honor in jesus name amen hallelujah thank you jesus again the same yesterday today and forever let's look at mark 12 verse 29 real quick And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is none other commandment greater than these. The two greatest commandments. So out of all those 1,050 laws and the 613 commandments in the Old Testament, the love of God simply said, I'm going to break this all down to where there's only two. And on these two, according to Matthew 22, all of these laws hang on these two. To love your God, first and foremost, more than anything else in the world with every ounce that's within you, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Wow. Over 1,600 of them compressed and put down, and God says, I'm going to give you two. And I also happen to know that you're really not even going to be able to do this on your own. But I've provided a way that you can do it, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. Hallelujah. You're not here on yourself. You're not trying to do any of this by yourself. And if you are, I'm going to tell you, you're going to fail and fail until you recognize you can't do it by yourself. You were never intended, as I've said many times, to do anything in this earth by yourself, but everything with the power and help of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. God's love and mercies towards us He sent His only begotten Son to hang on a cross. Then He takes all the laws and He compresses them into two laws that only have to be kept. 
And if you manage to do that, you've kept all the laws. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but I'm quite sure if you're married, you love your wife. And if you have children, you love your children. In fact, I'd do just about anything to protect them, to help them. But I know one thing I will never do, and that is simply to put them before I put God. He has got to be first place in my life. I have to make that choice. I will never reject God no matter what no matter what it entails that might happen if I would. It may look good, it may sound good, but it would be eternal damnation. And that is something none of us want to ever experience. And, wow, this is the one that gets a little hard. That one's not so bad. You go, I can handle loving God first, but I have to love my neighbor? just as I love myself. I looked up the word neighbor in the Greek and it is plesion. It means somebody that is near to you, close by. It is your fellow man, your countryman. It is a Christian or friend. Now I want to relate and go back to a story in the Old Testament in Luke 10, 29 through 37. <clears throat> it talks about the Good Samaritan. There's somebody making a journey from Jerusalem to Jer Jericho. And on the way, thieves attack him. They steal all of his goods, beat him up till he's near half death. And he's laying there on the side of the road. A priest comes by, looks at him, keeps on going. A Levite comes by, a person of the tribe of Levi. He looks at him walks on by then a Samaritan and if you've read the Bible you know the Samaritans and the Jewish people had a lot of ought between them and yet this Samaritan stopped bound up his wounds poured oil over them bound them up then picked him up and put him on his donkey and took him to an inn where he continued to care for him. Then he tells the innkeeper, I've got to go, but whatever he needs, you continue to give it to him, and I will come back, and I will pay anything that he had need of and you supplied to him. Then Jesus asked the person that was asking questions, said, out of the three, which do you think is the good person. Was it the priest? Well, look at his standing. Of the Levite? No. It turned out to be the Samaritan who stopped and did a good thing for him. It was his neighbor. Called him his neighbor. Someone that he didn't even know. God said, that's your neighbor. Do good to them. Love them. How many people have hurt you? How many people have done you wrong? How about your boss, your fellow employees, even your loved ones? And yet God says not only to forgive them, but to love them. Pray for them. Help them when they have need. Now that's a tough one. But again, all things are possible to those who believe. I believe that in the midst of all this, the Holy Spirit will be my helper and help me to walk in love towards anyone and everyone. I want a heart that's full of compassion. That's what it said about the Good Samaritan. He was full of compassion. He had a heart like Jesus, in other words, compassionate, full of love, that's what ought to dwell in us as Christians. For we are being transformed daily into the very image of Christ. To be compassionate, to have love for others, and to do good works that are filled with faith. Going out and touching the world, setting the captives free.
Hallelujah. Healing the sick. Having a comforting word. Because that's who and what Jesus did. I'm going to go to Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. It simply says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Which law? The ones that we were talking about. Love thy neighbor as yourself. We love to take that scripture and use it as a debt-free scripture, but really, it's simply talking about when you walk in love, you forgive man of anything that he's done, even things that he's thought, doesn't Jesus do that when you come to him and repent? He forgives you, throws it into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east from the west, and no longer remembers it. And God says, I made you in my image. Start acting like it. Start living a life that is full of compassion and love for your neighbor. Hallelujah. You need to go ahead and read the rest of Romans 13, I'm not going to take the time to do it tonight, but finish reading Romans 13. It only goes out to... Uh, 14 verses, so... Just go ahead and continue reading it, if you would. You know, depending on whose research you're looking at, some say there are over 30,000 promises in the Bible. Another source literally says, I read through the Bible and marked every one, and there was 8,810 promises of God. Let's just say there are a lot of promises in the Word of God. And we know the Scripture says that His promises are yes and amen. Every single promise that you find in the Bible is yes and amen. However, most of the promises in the, in the Bible, if you'll read those promises, you'll find out they're conditional. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whoops, condition, shall believe on him shall have everlasting life. What do you got to do? You got to believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross, that he died for your sins and he bore your sins. It's a conditional promise. But when you believe and you confess Jesus with your mouth, salvation comes and you are brought back into right standing with God. The word of God also says that he will never flood the earth like he did in Noah's time. That's an unconditional promise. God says, I'm not going to do this again. Doesn't matter what happens. Another unconditional promise is God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Didn't say that you had to do anything to obtain that. He just simply said, no, that I love you enough that I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. That I watch over you intently. You are the apple of my eye. Hallelujah. Folks, we're living in a time that we have to start doing our part fulfilling our role pastor talked about how if you were to knock it shall be opened unto you if you seek you will find if you ask you shall receive well guess what conditional if you're not asking how can you receive it says ask and you shall receive if you're not seeking God how will you find him if you're not knocking on the door God won't open it but God is faithful to not only open the doors that he wants opened if you'll just knock he'll close the doors 
that he doesn't want open, that you and I maybe have opened because we really wanted something. We thought we should be in this direction, going this way. And God is saying, let me shut that door and get you back on this side. You're going down the wrong path. And I'll open the right door. Look at 1 John 5, 14. This is the assurance or confidence that we have that if we pray or ask anything that's in God's will, He hears us. And knowing that He hears us, He guarantees that He has granted us our petitions. Again, we have to be asking according to His will, the Word of God. We can't just come and ask Him, God, I know I can't find it in the Bible, but I know I'm supposed to win this 1.02 billion lottery tomorrow. So I'm going to take everything out of my savings and buy as many tickets as I can. Will you please show me in the Bible where he's told you to take all your savings out? I'm not going to tell you whether you should or shouldn't buy a ticket. Ask God. He'll give you direction. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Glory to God. As I said earlier, the scripture says, God is not a man who should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? God is the author of faithfulness. And he is faithful, as I said earlier, to his word. He did not send his word so that it would return void and not accomplish that for which he sent. He put Jesus or allowed Jesus to go to the cross, to die a death, and be buried. And yet he resurrected him, raised him up to sit with us in heavenly places. Hallelujah. We sit with him in those heavenly places. He's at the right hand of the Father. He even told the disciples, it is better that I ascend and go to be with the Father because if I don't go, then the Holy Spirit's not going to come. Don't you know that you are the temple of the Most High God and that the Holy Spirit is dwelling, living in you, fulfilling God's promise to never leave you, nor forsake you? He is living in you and wherever you go, He goes. Wow. Wow. I might not go some places if I really thought about the fact that I'm taking the Holy Spirit in there with me. Maybe I wouldn't use some words thinking, wow, the Holy Spirit's right here hearing every word I say, every doubt, every unbelief that my mouth starts speaking. I might put a zipper over it. Might be actually asking God, forgive me, Lord, for I just disagreed with what your word says. And I need to get in my heart because out of the abundance of the heart, your word and begin fulfilling my role, speaking your word, causing things that aren't to be. Hallelujah. Now faith. 11.1 1, Hebrews. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not seen, things not seen. It is a title deed. Hallelujah. To what you can't see. But when you place your faith and your trust and your confidence in God, that's the key. Believing in God is all those things. Trusting God, putting your hope, putting your confidence, leaning on Him in every way possible, drawing nigh unto Him, and He draws nigh unto you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You start becoming a powerhouse in this earth. You start living the life God said He came, that He might give you life and life more abundantly. It is time for the church, for you and me in the entire body of Christ to start fulfilling our role and living the life that God intends for us to live. Hallelujah. Overcomers, victorious in every area of our life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hmm. James 5.16 talks about the effectual fervent prayer of a man the effectual fervent prayer. How many times do we pray? Well, I'm going to pray for you, and we might even actually say a prayer right then, and maybe even one or two more. But is that an effectual fervent and a fervent prayer? You're going to hold on, and you're going to continue praying for whatever it is you're praying until you see results. 
Hallelujah. Get fervent about what you want to see manifested in your life. Become an effectual prayer. Become one that is led by the Spirit of God in your prayer. And become dogged, fervent, not going to turn loose till I see the manifestation. I thank you, God, every day that your promises are yes and amen. And I start listing the promises that I want, the promises that I need, and I stay attached to them, not dropping them by the wayside and five years from now being reminded, oh, yeah, Lord, whatever happened to that? Well, you kind of turned loose. Are you going to pick it back up and start over again or start from where you left off? Hallelujah. Because God will pick it right back up where you left it and cause the manifestation to be manifested in your life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It goes on to say, I'm going to read Hebrews 10.35 out of the Amplified Bible. <clears throat> Do not therefore fling away your fearless confidence, for it carries a great and glorious compensation of reward. For you have need of steadfast patience and endurance, so that you may perform and fully accomplish the will of God, and thus receive and carry away and enjoy to the full what is promised. Hallelujah. Receive to the full what is promised. Glory to God. You know, in Mark 9, 23, it says, again, all things are possible to those who believe. In other words, you have to make a choice. I'm going to believe every word that I find in the Word of God. And I'm going to start studying the Word to show myself approved. I'm going to start going through this Word and reading it because I know as I find the promises, they're mine. And nothing can keep me from obtaining these promises to the full. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It carries a reward. In Hebrews 6, it talks about God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Wow. Diligently. It doesn't just say, go looking for Him. But if you diligently seek Him, then He is a rewarder. Hebrews 11.6. I'm going to read that real quick. Without faith it is impossible to please and be satisfactory to Him. For whoever would come near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that He is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek Him. Throughout Hebrews 11, you see that by faith, Abel brought a better offering. By faith, Enoch was caught up. Hallelujah. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went forth to a place that he didn't know. All these Old Testament saints, it tells us, believed God. And because they believed God, it was accredited to them as righteousness. Well, you and I have the cross of Christ and what Jesus did at the Christ. Our righteousness is in him. But he is still a rewarder of those who will diligently Seek Him. Diligently try to draw nigh unto Him. <clears throat> and as I said earlier, big order. So it seems. But remember, God has given us someone called our Helper, the Holy Spirit. I'll end with this. Guys, ladies, men, have you ever started a task? Guys, maybe it was working on your car, changing the brakes. Maybe it was crawling under a the cabinet, under a sink, to replace a garbage disposal or a faucet or something. Do you know what? It only took me a few times to learn 
that it was a much easier task when I had somebody helping me. That if I'm crawled up under the car or under the sink, instead of having to get out and go get another tool or, or have something go get a piece that I forgot, it was a lot easier to ask my helper, hey, would you go get me a pair of channel locks or a crescent wrench or would you bring me the brake pads? I forgot to set them over here. <clears throat> Women, if you're preparing a huge meal, you're having guests come over. Isn't it a help to have a helper there cutting and dicing the onions and bell peppers or carrots and chopping up the lettuce or bringing you things that you need as you're preparing things? It's nice to have a helper. It makes the task much easier. But if you don't ask them, will you do this for me? Will you do that? They just stand there wondering what you want. Yeah, I know God knows what you need before you ever even ask, but he says to ask. Ask your helper to help you find the things of God. Help you when you're seeking God. Help you receive when you ask help you to get the right door open close the doors that don't need to be never forget that you are the temple of the most high god that you are the one who may start the task do the good works but it is always going to be finished because of the help that the holy spirit gives you again I'll leave you with this one last statement. Make a choice to allow God into every area of your life. Let him help you. Let him guide you. Let him lead you. Let him teach you. He desires to be all those things. It's up to you and me to simply make a choice to say, I need your help. Please help me. God bless. Good evening. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. Empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk this earth as heavenly priests before God. Good night and amen.